Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Randy Rydell. I'm a member of the board uh, of directors of the Arms Control Association and a proud former employee of the UN's Office for Disarmament Affairs and current advisor to Mayors for Peace. It is my pleasure today to introduce Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, who is marking her fifth anniversary as the UN's Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. <laughs> Building on her extensive UN work in humanitarian assistance, she developed the Secretary General Guterres' disarmament agenda and its related plans and has diversified disarmament's base of support. Her office's key missions remain conventional arms control and the elimination of weapons of mass destruction. Together, in Dag Hammarskjöld's words, the UN's hardy perennial. If time permits, you may submit questions on available three by five cards, and I will pose as many as possible. Ms. Nakamitsu, welcome to our own happy anniversary. Well, thank you very much, Randy. So I'm only five years old and you guys are 50. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, obviously I want to start by congratulating the Arms Control Association on its golden anniversary. You know, for half a century, ACA has been providing the world, not just the United States, but the world, with advocacy, analysis, an awareness on some of the most critical topics of international nuclear uh, peace and security, including on how to achieve our common, joint, shared goal of a world free of nuclear weapons. And ACA uh, has also been, more importantly to me, a good friend to the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. And I must say, friends like you uh, are needed more than ever um, as we find ourselves in a, a very dangerous and very troubling times. Now, the UN Secretary General Guterres has described the war in Ukraine, which started on 24th of February uh, this year by the Russian invasion, as, and I quote, an absurdity in the 21st century and, and simply evil. The world has shaken the international system, the international order, and weakening the guardrails against the use and, of course, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. But it is, in many ways, the culmination of multiple trends that have been festering for years. We see openly hostile relationships between nuclear armed states, where distrust has replaced dialogue. Armed spending is at historical levels. Cyber and outer space have become potential new domains of conflict. Game-changing technologies have uh, been repurposed, I must say, to create new generations of conventional weapons with strategic capabilities. They have also lowered the barriers to WMD acquisition, especially uh, in case of biological weapons. The taboo against chemical weapons, as we all know, uh, has been repeatedly broken. So this global uh, disarmament and non-proliferation regime has achieved remarkable results. I think we all need to remember that in shielding, uh, shielding the international community from the horrors of WMD. But the cracks in the facade were beginning to show even before Ukraine. Expensive modernization programs, coupled with expanding roles and dangerous rhetoric, illustrate clearly how nuclear weapons are trending in the wrong directions. Regional conflicts are fueling proliferation drivers. 
The conflict in Ukraine, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, has promulgated the false narrative, I would say, that nuclear weapons provide the ultimate security guarantees. Meanwhile, the disarmament machinery is a um, miasma of dysfunction. Very sad. Divisions over the pace and scale of um, disarmament have widened into chasms. The Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, for so long the bedrock of the entire regime, faces, I must say, unprecedented challenges. Now, the use of chemical weapons in the Syrian Arab Republic and elsewhere has undermined the historic achievements of the Chemical Weapons Convention. The failure to hold the perpetrators of these horrific um, um, acts accountable would really imperil the entire regime, and we are very concerned about that. Now, turning to another WMD, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the global lack of preparedness and demonstrated the disruption uh, that could be caused or if biological agents were to be used as a weapons of war and terror. Yet while it remains a pillar of international peace and security, the Biological Weapons Convention's lack of mechanism to verify compliance severely limits its effectiveness. Now, I would like to come back to these issues of B, uh, CWC and BWC later because these are extremely important. So, this is really not a, a pretty picture, as you can see. The guardrails against WMD use and acquisition are simply eroding. The war in Ukraine, which is veiled nuclear threats and new daily allegations regarding chemical and biological weapons has placed a spotlight on existing damage. The question, therefore, is what can we do and what should we do? When it comes to nuclear weapons, current events have highlighted two urgent near-term objectives the development of measures to reduce the risk of nuclear war, and the reinforcement of the norm against use. But clearly, this is not enough. For our collective security, we need to reverse course and take practical steps along the path to a world free of nuclear weapons. Arms control and disarmament efforts are instruments for our security and not an idealistic dream. None of these objectives can be achieved without dialogue and engagement. Although the current situation makes it difficult, we all know that, the United States and the Russian Federation need to return to dialogue at the first available opportunity, if only to ensure the efficacy of crisis communication. Even during the hottest moments of the Cold War, that is the previous Cold War, these states were able to engage in dialogue. New START will expire in four years. Time is running out to negotiate a successor and that obviously this cannot happen without dialogue and engagement. Now, I hope this doesn't sound too strange in this audience, the world's top arms control experts. After a major crisis, there will always be windows of opportunity uh, for engagement and negotiations in arms control that will open up. Because it is necessary for our security. So, I guess now is the time to, um, in this context, now is the time to identify key issues and prepare ourselves for that day so that the, the moment the window of opportunity opens up, 
we will be able to immediately start substantive negotiations and engagement. And in that regard, I cannot stress enough the importance of the five MPT nuclear weapon states, P5 also, N5 and P5, engagement. In an increasingly multipolar co uh, world, coordination amongst these five is essential. They carry special responsibilities. This brings me to the NPT and its 10th uh, review conference taking place in August, just around the corner from now. As I said, the NPT faces unprecedented challenges. Even before the war in Ukraine, issues like regional proliferation crisis, uh, submarine uh, propulsion technologies, and, and diversions on disarmament threaten the consensus outcome. Despite all these, I hope that states parties still will do their best to strengthen the NPT and by extension, the regime itself. The treaty, this treaty, is simply that important. The um, absence of consensus would not necessarily undermine the regime. What will jeopardize the NPT and the tangible benefits it provides is if states parties do not approach the review conference with a willingness to listen, negotiate, and compromise. A review conference wrecked by division, um, divisive actions will endanger the central role of that treaty and we don't want to see that happening. Now having said that, I believe there are several areas in which this review conference will still be able to make progress to reinforce disarmament and non-proliferation guardrails. First, all states parties can reaffirm their commitment to the norm against the use of nuclear weapons. Even under the current circumstances, the P5 or N5 should reaffirm their January joint statement. States parties should also reaffirm their commitments to strengthening the norm against proliferation and also testing. Second, states parties should reaffirm the commitments they have undertaken as parties to the MPT, especially under the, um, the famous article, that is Article 6. They should engage in dialogue about accountability for the implementation of these commitments. Third, states parties should agree to a set of measures to reduce the risk of nuclear war, including at the nexus between technology and nuclear weapons. These could include transparency and confidence building measures or doctrinal changes. Fourth, the positive impact of peaceful uses is growing, including on the achievement of the sustainable development goals Ensuring access for all states' parties to these benefits, I think, would be a clear success. Fifth, the conference should strengthen the safeguard system, including through universalization of the comprehensive safeguards agreements and ensuring the IAEA has necessary financial and human resources. Now, 2021 saw the entry into force of a new guardrail, and I speak under the authority of Elaine, of course, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The TPNW's first meeting of states' parties later this month is an opportunity for this instrument to demonstrate its complementarity with the um, broader regime and to strengthen its important focus on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. The TPNW membership base uh, remains relatively small still, 
And I think even the, the most ardent supporters would agree that its implementation will take some time. But I have been impressed with the pragmatic and principled way states parties are working uh, towards these uh, goals. Now, I said I will come back to chemical and biological weapons issues, so let me quickly talk about what I see as key issues. The scourge of chemical weapons should really have been consigned to history, yet the last decade has seen repeated use of these heinous weapons. 25 years after its birth, the CWC remains one of the most important achievements in disarmament. Through the verifiable destruction of 99% of global declared chemical weapons stockpiles, the CWC has made the world definitely a safer place. However, the norm against chemical weapons has been subjected to repeated challenges, driven by failures of compliance, the rise of non-state actors capable of acquiring and using chemical weapons, and developments in science and technology as well. Perhaps most disheartening has been the inability so far, because I haven't given up on that, to hold the perpetrators of chemical weapons use accountable. Such profound viola violations of international law cannot continue to go unaddressed. Recent challenges to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, technical authority, and to the professionalism of the technical secretariat, not only undermined efforts to eliminate chemical weapons, but also the entire disarmament and non-proliferation regime. So let me take this opportunity once again to thank the OPCW's uh, technical secretariat for its professionalism, impartiality, and dedication. And I know that these sentiments are held by vast majority of CWC state parties, but they need to be um, openly demonstrated, um, these support, especially uh, regarding the investigation into an identification of perpetrators of chemical weapons use. I guess ultimately, uh, the only way to reinforce the taboo against chemical weapons is for all state parties to the convention to strictly abide by their obligations. But the Security Council needs to do its job as well by uniting to end the crime of use of chemical weapons with impunity. Now, next year, the fifth review conference of the state parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention will be an important milestone in the life of this treaty and provides an opportunity to strengthen the norm um, against chemi uh, chemical weapons use and also set a um, strategic direction for the OPCW for the next five years and, of course, beyond. So my call is, let us start working together um, to restore fully this very important convention called the Chemical Weapons Convention. Now turning to BWC, the Biological Weapons Convention. As I noted earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic brought into stark relief the need for a fully operationalized properly institutionalized and fit for purpose, if you will, BWC uh, in the 21st century. We should be grateful that no country today professes a desire to acquire biological weapons, nor um, a need for such weapons for national security reasons. But as recent events have shown, we cannot take this for granted. The erosion of the taboo against chemical weapons, I think, sets an alarming precedent. This year, the BWC states parties will hold the convention's ninth review conference, November, December. The review conference is an ideal opportunity for states to unite and strengthen 
this vital convention. The states parties could consider the range of different options, but today let me just uh, mention four um, issues. First, states parties should operationalize the convention by giving teeth to its provisions, supporting peaceful scientific cooperation, enhancing transparency in research, and promoting beneficial applications of new technologies. And states should also establish mechanisms supporting national implementation and investigation and responding to alleged violations. The second area, states should institutionalize the convention, providing it with the necessary human capital to oversee its many functions. Regimes against chemical weapons and, of course, nuclear proliferation and testing already benefit from organizations that engage in outreach, training, and capacity building, and as a result, have larger memberships and higher levels of implementation. Third, the governments must adequately fund the convention, please, ahead of the review conference. They should prepare for a significant increase in the convention's budget. Currently, most of states' parties pay less than $1,000 a year. Finally, states should explore how to verify compliance with the Convention's obligations. This issue has, was last explored over 20 years ago, and much has changed in the meantime, of course, both the threats and the technologies to ensure adherence to the rules. So, you need to think about those things. Now, as we seek to strengthen the BWC, we should remember that member states of the UN also has another tool which it comes, uh, which, when it comes to investigating the use of biological weapons. And this is the uh, United Nations Secretary General's mechanism for investigation of alleged use of chemical, biological, and toxin weapons. And this is not related to the BWC. And its mandate relates only to the investigation of alleged use and nothing else. Nor is the mechanism a standing body. It relies on the generosity of member states to maintain its roster of state-nominated laboratories and experts that can be called upon to conduct investigations at a very short notice. However, the UN SGMs um, is currently the only international mechanism for investigation of alleged use of biological weapons. In the absence of the BWC verification mechanism, it is essential, we believe, that the UN SG SGMs independence is preserved and its preparedness strengthened. I want to stress that there are many arrows in the international quiver for dealing with the threats posed by WMDs. Those arrowheads really uh, need to be kept sharp and ready for use. And let me conclude today with my final message. The rapidly evolving geostrategic environment also demands a reassessment of whether the international community has everything it needs to confront the dangers of WMD, whether existing structures should be adapted, and whether we need new tools. In other words, should we not have a new updated vision for arms control and disarmament? And we heard a lot of interesting conversations in the previous panel. In his report on our common agenda, Secretary General of the United Nations stated, and I quote, the risks to peace and security are growing. The world is moving closer 
to the brink of instability. In response, he called for a new agenda for peace that will include, and again I quote, a renewed effort to agree on a more effective collective security responses. And this new agenda will also serve, again, quote, to update our vision for disarmament so as to guarantee human, national, and collective security. This update will need to address many of the challenges that I have mentioned, as well as new elements regarding ungoverned spaces such as missiles or non-strategic nuclear weapons. It should also support efforts to place guardrails around areas that do not have them, from cyber to outer space and artificial intelligence. And we should also look at linkages between these new issues, new areas, with the traditional weapons of mass destruction. We have to also look at responsible behavior, capabilities and qualities, not just quantities and specific types of weapons in silo. Finally, it should seek to ensure that disarmament and arms control take the rightful place as a pillar of the international peace and security architecture. So obviously we have much work ahead of us, so I'm counting on you. Um, I know that um, with the necessary political will and readiness to engage, our goals are indeed achievable. And I look forward in that regard uh, to working very closely with the Arms Control Association and all of its members uh, to this end. I thank you very much and looking forward to some exchanges. I would like to begin with just one question um, that, that's been on my mind as I look over your resume, uh, your vast uh, experience working throughout the UN system on humanitarian issues. Starting with the 90, 1996 International uh, Court of Justice advisory opinion, going through the 2010 NPT review conference and culminating in the 2017 the Ban Treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, one common theme in all of these has been the need to focus on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of using these weapons, and above all, the importance uh, of, the, of the full implementation of international humanitarian law. Given all your background in this, in this area of humanitarian uh, approaches to, to global problems, to what extent will humanitarian law provide a guardrail for future uh, or work in our field of disarmament and arms control in both conventional and WMD? Well, I think it is. Yes. I think it is one of the critical um, guidance that the international community has to receive. It's, you know, the, the arms control and, and disarmament efforts have. Um, its origin um, from humanitarian efforts. I think, you know, when I talk about the chemical weapons, um, it's very clear that it really in was initially addressed through that lens um, that people, both the civilians and combatants, do not have to, to have unnecessary pains and, and suffer. Um, so I think these humanitarian principles and IHO, international humanitarian law in general, covering you know, the spectrum of disarmament efforts um, from nuclear to, I mean, from weapons of mass destruction to anything else, the heavy weapons being used in populated areas. I think it is probably one of the core uh, directions that we have to remember. And that's why I you know, uh, really uh, commend the, the TPNW um, states parties um, to refocus this issue in the first uh, uh, conference of states parties. Um, you know, I think one of the, the shocking impact of the, the war um, against Ukraine was that veiled threat 
uh, and then that really refocused um, you know, potential conflict, uh, consequences of the, the actual use of nuclear weapons. So all the elements are there for us to actually really focus on the humanitarian approach, humanitarian uh, principles. Um, and um, what we have to remember is that it will benefit all of us. It will have a security benefit to all states parties. It will have, of course, you know, the humanitarian benefits that we must uh, maintain and retain. Okay, I'm, I'm informed we have time only for one more question. Oh. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. <laughs> I, a lot of speakers have uh, addressed the issue of the, training the next generation. And I know that the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs, one of its uh, core missions has been to try to promote education, disarmament education. I wonder if you could say a few words about uh, some of the uh, uh, activities of ODA and disarmament education and also some of the, the challenges that you face ahead. Right. I, I think you all know the, the famous uh, fellowship program that has been there for so many years that have actually trained so many of the actual negotiators of those disarmament uh, agreements. Um, but building on that, we have now been expanding much more in the education and, and learning training uh, area of our work. Um, you know, number one, of course, uh, in the, the era of online learning, uh, we are preparing and also updating the content uh, of uh, learning materials so that they will be more um, you know, access uh, accorded to wider group of people who are interested uh, in pursuing these areas. But also, uh, we have created uh, new uh, activities, very much focused on the youth. Um, we've um, uh, created um, um, sort of a youth fellowship program. It's not as long as uh, uh, six weeks, uh, but um, the youth um, champions that we, you know, select from around the world with diverse backgrounds, uh, very young people, I think um, only up to the university age, um, they um, you know, uh, do the online courses, um, they engage with us, and then they, is, they, they, they have these uh, opportunities to visit the key disarmament locations like New York, Geneva, but also Hiroshima. Um, so it's, um, we've only done it once, and then we would definitely continue uh, to, um, uh, to create uh, you know, the, the younger, next generation of people who will carry um, our movements forward. What is important is that they bring new perspectives. Um, because I'm only five years old in this job, I think one of the things that we need to do is to bring in new perspectives things that we have never thought about. And that is very much needed, and I think it was very clear in the previous panel discussions on emerging technologies. There are challenges and security threats that did not exist when those important disarmament achievements, agreements were made. So um, we need new talents, diverse perspectives, people who can you know, talk about what disarmament means in their given local communities and create new movements why this is important for their security. That way, I think we can empower the, the younger generation with diverse uh, profiles and also create um, you know, a cadre of uh, next generation's negotiators. Uh, I would like to say on behalf of the association, uh, speaking for all of us, the congratulations on your fifth uh, uh, anniversary. <laughs> and also best wishes for the success in all of your work across the entire spectrum of missions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>